Yep. Okay. Hello. Um, so we have an hour and a half for this, uh, which probably means it's not only going to be a lecture uh, in the standard sense that I'm going to be standing here and talking to you guys. Towards the end, I'm going to ask you guys to participate as well. I want to do some tiny little exercises. Sorry to hopefully help you get a better grip of what we're going to be talking about. So on the schedule, you, you read, not Rob, uh, you read that this lecture is going to be on framing. And at least for me, when I first heard about this, it was, um, it was a largely magical thing that good debaters are able to do well. And So it's something that good debaters were supposedly able to do well and bad or not as good debaters didn't know anything at all. So my first question for you guys is, what do you think framing is? What is this? Anyone, go! It's the way you uh, put a lens on a round and tell you want to construct all the arguments and how you want the round to go. Okay, cool. I like this. Uh, let's just keep one thing in mind while we're answering questions and looking for explanations, we're trying to find the simplest way of explaining things possible, right? So in stupid words, what is framing? Concentration. Okay. What else? Come on. Sorry, you're going to have to speak louder. Like characterizing the debate, like when you present it. What does it mean to characterize the debate? Like to put your perspective on it, give it some like, relevance in the real world, or the debate. Okay. What else? Like putting the debate into context. What does that mean? Uh, I mean, basically what she said. Like putting, like, taking instead of just a list of words and being like, this is what it it means to debate this. Okay. Does anyone know where the word framing comes from, or the concept, or what was the original meaning of framing when somebody talked about this 150 years ago? Sorry, louder. Is a frame, yes. What is framing? It is putting the picture into the frame, yes. Why does it matter? Why was this a thing? Why did people talk about framing? To make the picture more expensive. <laughs> Sorry, to make the picture look prettier or more expensive? Yeah. Alright. Yeah, okay, so it turns out that it matters what kind of frame you put around the picture. Right? So if you paint a picture and put a simple frame around it, and then take the same picture and put a, a baroque frame around it in gold and little details and everything. When people look at the picture, they're going to see a different work of art. They're going to interpret it differently. They're going to say different things about it. So it matters, at least to the artist, to painters, what type of frame that picture goes into. And even today, when we're talking about, when, if you're, for instance, an art historian, or whatever your education might be, but you're setting up exhibitions, the way you're going to be framing the pictures matters a lot, right? Where you're going to put the lights, what kind of frames you're going to be putting around pictures. Maybe you don't want a frame, right? Maybe you want the picture, maybe it makes sense for the picture to be, for the painting to be embedded into the wall, right? All of these things are decisions that at, sorry, that at the end of the day aren't going to change the content of the picture, of the painting, because it always remains the same. However, they are going to greatly influence the way people are going to experience the work of art you're displaying. Right? And that's where the idea comes from. Right? So that the frame around the picture, even though it's not directly the painting itself, matters or even influences the way the painting works. Let me just fix the door. Okay. So how does this then work? in debating, or better yet, in language. Because the other thing that's important is that even though we are going to be talking about debating in this hour and a half, right, and we're going to try to apply the lessons of framing to debating, it is an effect that happens every single time you use language, okay? So it isn't something that is only relevant to debating, 
It is relevant to every single time you're going to engage in linguistic acts throughout your lives. Okay? Um, so keep that in mind. However, the way we think of framing when it comes to language is in a variety of different ways. Okay? So people are going to give different explanation of explanations of what exactly framing is and they're going to take it to different lengths, right? Some people are going to say, oh, it's only the choice of words that you have, then we're going to, uh, then we're going to get people who are going to say, no, 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 it's the way you decide on which concepts you're going to operate with. And then there's people who take it even further who say that it's the poetic structure of your speeches and so on and so forth. But basically the idea is that you can make, let's call them tiny changes to the way you say things that make large differences in the way things are interpreted. Okay? Now, the first, I think, example, and probably my favorite one because it's as clear as possible, is the difference between two words. To murder someone and to kill someone. Who can tell me what the difference is between those two? Oh. Yeah. Dark. Yeah, go. I think murder has like a far stronger connotation. What does far stronger mean? It's it just... sounds much more violent than kill. Okay. Yeah, just there, 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 and then in the back. I think murder implies like that there was an intent to do the killing beforehand, whereas killing could be accidental, could be manslaughter. What if you kill someone in a war? That's not murder, but you were pointing at the person. Okay. What else? Come on. Let's murder, try I think, is a stuff. stronger verb. It applies more action than to kill because it comes with all the negative context that they're What does that about. mean, more action? I could murder someone by staring at them and using my mental powers to destroy them, and I could kill someone with a small, tiny spoon, right? It would take more action. It, like, more ac <laughs> it means a better picture to whoever heard your words, like, construe what you did. Then what you do you know? mean by it paints a better picture? It paints a different picture. We don't know if it's better yet, right? It, it's going to depend on what we're going to want to do. Yeah? Um, but I would say that murder falls under the umbrella of to kill someone because it's a specific way of specific way of describing the way that you mean. All right. Yes, but what is the difference in the specificity, right? What makes murder a specific case of killing someone? Well, murder would be when well, as people said, intent to kill someone, but killing could be with intent, without intent, it could be any number of things, whereas mine is more a specific. Okay. Uh, cool. Yep. Yeah. They're in the back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, murder is quite, has five more, it's like graphically violent when someone says you murder someone, and then it's also, it is why it's more one on one, whereas you kill lots and lots of people, whereas murder is usually used more personal times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Murder is the narrowing down of killing to the cases in which it's intentional and system systemic, as in it has been planned. Okay, cool. So, lesson number one. It doesn't matter what the dictionary says, people are going to make up their own meanings of the words. And if you want to be able to effectively engage in what we call framing, you're constantly going to be placing bets on the way people are going to be interpreting these words, right? So, even though none of you explained what, at least I read in a dictionary, the difference between the words murder and kill are, these are all legitimate ways of differentiating between those two words, right? The point being, you as a speaker don't get to claim the vocabulary and the definitions of regular words other people are going to operate under, right? So that is something that you're constantly going to have to keep in mind. Now, in order to solve this, to answer this question, what's the difference between murder and kill? And please tell me if you agree. Killing someone does not imply you doing something morally wrong. When you murder someone, you did something morally horrible, right? You did a wrong thing. If you killed someone, you are forgiven. If you murdered someone, you are not forgiven in any way, right? And you can kill someone in a brutal way because you were negligent, or you can murder someone in a very elegant, clean way, and we would still call it murder. Right? Does the difference make sense? Okay. And now imagine a situation in which you have a debate or a discussion or a speech, and it doesn't matter, and you have to talk about people killing people. Right? And it's 
but most of the time, it's not even going to be a decision for you guys and girls of which words to use, whether or not you're going to use murder or you're going to use kill. But at the end of the day, you're going to be making a different argument depending on which word you're going to be choosing. Right? If you're going to be saying that killing people should never be allowed, is a different thing than saying murdering people should never be allowed. But both of these sentences slightly don't make sense. So I'm going to try to choose a different example. So for instance, we're going, you're going to be describing a person who did something to show us an example in this debate. And you can either choose to say that this person killed another person, which might be factually, which probably will be factually correct. But in the case where you want to elicit a stronger emotional response, where you want to clearly communicate that this was something bad, morally bad, you should probably use the word murder. Okay? And this was a very simple example. Do you guys all understand what we're aiming at here? Okay? Now, in the most basic sense, the only thing framing concerns is choosing the right words in this way. Okay? The problem with this, however, is that most of the time this is going to be happening without you guys even getting a chance to think about which word you're going to use. Right? Because you're up there, you're standing, you're speaking, your notes are only a couple of lines long, right? you have to make up words as you go along, so oftentimes you're not going to get the effect you would desire in an ideal world. Right? So the question now becomes, how do we deal with framing or how do we make sure that we frame the things that we say in the best way possible. Now before we go into that, I think there's a couple of things that we should take a look at for you guys to appreciate the magnitude um, of the impact framing can, can have on people. And the first thing that I'd like to show you is a very interesting effect that language produces. And in general terms, we could say that, and of course we'll be over, oversimplifying, but you can only understand language if you experience the words that you are listening to. Right? And I think that, I, I love this example, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So, as soon as I start talking about these things, you guys cannot force yourselves not to be thinking about the same things. You're going to start experiencing the thing that I'll talk about right now, right? So at the moment where I start discussing the chairs that you guys are sitting on and the way your ass feels on the chair and whether or not you want to move a little bit because it's getting sweaty and it's slightly uncomfortable, right? There is absolutely no way for you guys to escape experiencing the situation of you sitting on that chair and how exactly your bottom feels, right? In much the same way, right? Rhetorical questions, for instance, do not exist as far as your brain is concerned because your brain demands and produces an answer immediately. So how much is 2 plus 2? And I don't want you to answer that, but I'm already too late because all of you immediately get the answer in your brain. Right? And these are all the things that are constantly be happening, that will constantly be happening as you guys will be speaking to people. Right? So. I think it's time for us to drop this idea of debating or even conversation or even words as math, right? In a way, we take a debate, we listen to a debate, we write it down, we choose the words we write down with carefully, and then at the end of the debate, we look at the flow and we somehow make the brilliant calculation of who won, right? A lot of the things that are going to be happening in debating are going to be dependent on these tiny little effects that the use of language produces, right? So that's number one. Number two, why framing is super important is because judges need a way to write down what you're saying in the most clear, simple way possible. Okay? There is no one, I'm willing to bet no one on this planet that writes by hand that is going to be able to write with the same speed as you're speaking. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, so there's going to be no one, uh, make sure you close the door properly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's going to be no one in this world that's going to be writing down things in the same speed that you were speaking. Which means that judges are constantly going to be making concessions, right? They're going to be writing things shorter, they're going to be using acronyms. Oftentimes, right, more often than not, judges themselves are going to slightly reframe what you're saying in order for it to fit on a piece of paper, okay? So they're going to be using stronger words to make your arguments shorter, right? So for instance, 
bad people should be put in prison when you are explaining how people who are criminals and who have violated society's norms, their freedom should be taken away. Right? In a judge's notes, that might show up as bad people should go to prison. Right? Next point, because judges don't have time to write things down. So in that sense, it becomes super important for you to also make the job easier for the judge. And I think that with proper framing, with the proper use of words, that's going to be tremendously helpful to them. Okay? Another thing that I think you should never forget is the fact that judges are people too. Right? They had to wake up at 7 a.m. And probably because they're not high school kids, they've been drinking the night before with friends they haven't seen for quite some time. Right? Or, maybe they haven't been drinking, but it's also been three or four days of the tournament for them, and they're getting tired. And they have to wake up at 7 a.m. every morning, get on the buses, drive here, drive there, do their explanations, everything, and their attention is going to be slightly lower, right? So you have to keep all those things in mind, and I think that you have to debate in a way that makes the judges' lives easier. Now, last thing before we go into some actual framing advice. Number one. Not number one, this is the last thing. There's no numbering here. Huh? Um, and now I forgot what I had to say. Yes. Uh, last thing that we have to cover before we move on, as far as framing is concerned, uh, is this idea that you yourself are not the only one that is capable of running the frame for your own team. Huh? So, as we're going to go through the exercises and through the ideas, they're mostly going to be individual. But there is one thing that is very, very, very important here, which is that if you want to be successful in your framing, the whole team is going to have to be using the same dictionary, or pretty much the same dictionary, when explaining things. Okay? There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, remember the example of between murder and kill? Now imagine having a debate about what we should do with people who murder other people. And we have some speakers on your team who constantly use the word murder, and we have some speakers on your team who constantly use the word kill. Right? Or maybe even worse, you use the word kill in just one of the arguments that you're presenting. Right? Even though what you mean is actually murder, that one single argument becomes much weaker or be it, it becomes sidetracked in the debate, or it can become sidetracked in the debate because of the way you're using words to describe the issue at hand. Okay? That's number one. Reason number two is that most of the time, the, the judges are going to follow what happens in the first speech and then try to assign arguments or points to the same structure that was presented in the first speech. Right? That's especially important in world schools format where you have an obligation as the first speaker to present the whole team line, which means the judges can have a realistic expectation that this is everything that's going to happen. Right? Which means that if you have the first speaker who's framing the arguments, and even the arguments they are not making, but the second or third speaker are going to make, in a in a way, and then you have the second and third speakers who are going to be framing those arguments in a different way, that's going to completely destroy the effect that you want to achieve. Right? Now lastly, I would say, the most important thing, or the most beneficial thing, that can happen to you when you try to frame your arguments as good as you possibly can, is to get the other side, so if your government the opposition, if your opposition the government, to start using the same words you are, Right? Because then you get to force them to think about your arguments in a very, very, very specific way. Right? And also, it constantly reminds the judge that these are the ways in which you should interpret those things. Okay, any questions so far? No. Okay, now, point number one, as far as practical advice is concerned, Framing is not just about words, it is about thinking, which means that framing a debate in a very good way would mean thinking about the debate in a very good and interesting way. Here's an example. The debate is this house believes abortion should be legal or illegal, it doesn't matter which way we word it. And what we're going to get is one side is most probably going to argue that the fetus is already a human being and that we shouldn't, 
we should never kill a human being because life is sacred, yada, 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 the whole argument, you should know how it goes, right? Now, what happens in this argument is this side, this team that makes this argument frames the debate as a debate around human beings, right? At the moment where they choose to decide to talk about the fetus as a human being, if they are going to be successful in their framing, they won't have to use the word fetus ever again in the debate, but they'll constantly be talking about the unborn child that you are going to viciously murder when you take an abortion. Right? Now, on the other hand, the other side here is probably going to have an interest to continuously use the word fetus to dispel this idea that the fetus is a human being. Right? That is one way of trying to tackle that debate. But in a different way, which I find very interesting, and it actually happened in a debate, is for the opposition, in this case, let's say, to take on the framing of the government side, right, saying that the fetus is a person, and using that against them, right? So, how would we go about that? If the opening government comes out and says, oh, sorry, opening government, if the first government speaker comes out and says, yes, the fetus is a kid, it's a human being, you should never kill human beings because life is sacred, right? The opposition then comes out, and if they want to win the framing debate, they're going to have a very, very hard time. Sometimes it might make more sense to subvert the way the proposition, the government have been talking about the fetus, and use it to our own advantage. So we might do something like saying, coming out and saying, yes, the fetus is a person, but so is the mother. And we believe that each and every human being has the right to self-defense. And insofar as that person is stealing resources, it can uh, increase the amount of illnesses that mother, potential mother is going to experience, actually endangers her life, she has a right to self-defense against that person who now has agency to kill her, and we believe that abortion falls under the right of self-defense. Okay? Do you see what happens in both of these two different debates? Right? Even though we are making pretty much the same argument, right? because when you're going to be talking about the fetus as a non-person, you're still going to be making the argument that that fetus endangers the mother, that she can die, that it's stealing her resource, not stealing, that it's using her resources, that it can make her sick, so on and so forth. You basically get the same effect, but the way this argument sounds like and the way this argument performs is much, much, much different. Right? Now, I don't think there is a way where you can decide which way you want to frame this uh, in prep time, 100% sure, right? I don't think that's, that's a bet that you make as you're prepping, but at the same time what I'm trying to say is try to use framing contextually, right? So even as you're listening to a debate, consider the words that people are using, the way they are describing them, and pick your fights carefully. Okay? You don't have to win every single definition of the word or every single meaning or every single moral value of every description that you are going to be using. Okay? Does this make sense? Cool. Number two, how do you make sure that framing actually ha or how do you frame your arguments or what do you do in prep time if you want to make sure that you're actually framing your speeches? Now, I think this process is slightly different for native speakers than it is for um, second language speakers, or even non-native non speakers is probably a better word, especially because of the way we approach the vocabularies and the language that we use. So, for native speakers, this is going to be a task of finding synonyms, and it comes through much more naturally, because you guys get to, let's call it, feel the meaning of the word, right? So if I call, I don't know, if I call you a murderer, or if I call you a killer, you're probably going to feel the difference of that name, right? Whereas non-native speakers have to approach this on a, let's call it, much more intellectual basis, because even if I call you uh, a murderer or a killer, it pretty much, in most cases, is going to incite the same emotional response in you, right? Insofar as you don't completely understand or haven't completely grasped the nature of the words murder or kill. So the process is going to be slightly different, right? Now, for all of you, I wish there was one thing that you should do. Research shows and there's a bunch of research for that, that there is absolutely no way you can get people to decide on something purely rationally. Okay? 
there has been no experiment where we have been able to make people, uh, to force people to make completely rational decisions. It just doesn't work, right? In simple terms, I believe that means that emotional states are part of the argument, right? There is no way you can make a purely rational argument simply because of, if for nothing else, the words that you are going to be using, right? And if you are going to be using sterile words that don't carry any emotional meaning, that argument is still going to be interpreted as sterile, non-emotional, right? The absence of emotion is going to be noted. So there is absolutely no way, I think, that you can make a purely rational argument. So this is point number one. But once that is true, that gives you the option to start planning what those irrationalities in your argument are going to be. And I think one of the cool tricks of how to do it, and of course, were we to approach this scientifically, this is in no way the solution, but I think in the sense that you guys have a debate and you have an hour to prepare or how much ever time you need, um, I think this is actually very useful. So what I'd like you to do is I want you to, when you get the motion, to consider the emotional value of the arguments that you're going to be making. And I'm going to give you an example. And this happened three, maybe even four years ago. There was a debate academy, uh, not here, in Orwood, uh, during the winter, and we had a presentation debate, something, something, a public debate. It was a BP round, so British parliamentary, and me and Maya, my debate partner back then, we were the second team. So basically, imagine I was the third speaker, right? The third affirmative speaker, and I had to bring out a new argument. The motion was that this house would require girls under 18 to get permission from their parents to get an abortion. Sorry, right? So basically, if you're under 18, you want to get an abortion, you're not allowed to do it alone, you have to get one of your parents to sign it. Right? Now, we had time to prepare. We were thinking about what we were going to do. We thought out our argument clearly, and our argument basically was, I don't remember the details anymore, but it was basically one of those semi-feminist, not semi, uh, arguments where you go and say, well, this is unfair to girls, right? Because such a policy puts even more burdens on girls, whereas boys can simply get around it, right? Because at the moment where the girl is the only one who has to ask for permission, right, the boys can roam freely and we would much prefer a world where boys would also have to get a permission slip, whatever, etc., etc., right? It, the details I don't think are important. What is important, however, is I think that we can describe this argument as an angry argument. Right? The key emotion there was we were angry at the world of what was happening. And I'm going to argue, and I'm the only one on this planet who's ever going to say this, but I also think I'm the only one who can say this, is that I explained this argument well. Right? I followed all the rules, it, was, it wasn't a brilliant argument, it was a good argument. And everyone in the room was supposed to understand it. What happened was, nobody had a clue what was talking about. Right? Nobody understood the argument in the way that we understood it. And the question that was raised, at least in my head, why did this happen, right? Because even Brianna was trying to convince me that we didn't have an argument, which absolutely wasn't true, because even if I only read the words on my piece of paper, we had to have had an argument. So what happened? I think what happened was that I had the wrong introduction. So because we had so much time and because we started researching, we also had a very fancy intro to our team line, which was basically a bunch of dramatized cases, very, very sad, about girls who had to get a back alley abortion and what happened to them and how they died or were facing extreme pain and how sad they were and what, what happened to their parents and so on and so forth. And there was five or six cases like these and it took me about 40 seconds to explain all of this and then I went into my speech. Now, I'm going to argue that what I think happened there was that my introduction set up the wrong emotional expectation as to what the argument is going to be, right? And because people were thinking now about my speech in terms of, oh, this is sad, right? Oh, this is depressing, all oh, those poor girls, as soon as I was trying to make an argument that was trying to function in a different emotional registry, that argument failed, right? It flopped. Because, the, because my audience was actually trying to interpret the words that were coming out of my mouth in the sense of where can I find the tragedy of little girls in this, whereas the argument that we were making contained no tragedy but pure anger, right? 
So if I, I think that if you want to be successful in framing, what I think you have to do is I think you have to first identify what the key emotions are that you want to express, let's say, in your case, right? And when do they come and how do they come? And then secondly, go through your arguments and assign emotional value to your arguments as well, right? You can then do two things. Number one, you can rearrange the arguments, right? The order of your arguments so that the story or the emotional story flows much better. And secondly, you can probably tweak your arguments out of a certain emotion into a different one, right? I think that it wouldn't take it, it wouldn't have taken us too much effort to change the argument that we were trying to make in this abortion debate from an angry one to a sad one. And I think we would have been much, much, much more successful were we to do that. Okay? So also in this case, I think what you have to do is you just have to follow your gut. I don't think there's any recipe I can give you that's going to point out directly what types of emotions you're dealing with when you're framing your own argument. So we now have two lessons so far. What are they? Number one, you are it's not alone. Not just, but more, it's also about thinking. Yeah. Number one, I would say, is you should never forget that you are not alone in this. Okay? Your whole team is responsible for framing. And unless your whole team works to pull this off, this isn't going to work. Okay? I think this is the most important thing as far as practical framing is concerned. And what is number two? What we just covered. Think about the emotional response. Yes. Okay? So your arguments are going to have an emotional component. Don't shy away from it. Embrace it. Form it. Use it to your best advantage. Okay? Now, moving on. Number three. This also falls into this idea that framing is not just about style, it is also about understanding. Okay? So, when you're going to be framing things, when is the framing part mostly going to happen? In what part of your argument? Maybe I'm asking the question in a very bad way, but I'd still like you to try to answer. Okay? So if you have an argument, let's say every argument has a statement explaining an illustration, where does the framing happen? Yeah. I feel like it should happen like immediately after you give the argument the tagline. It's like when you're explaining the logic behind it, the emotion should come out. Okay, I would I would just say the emotion should come out in the tagline, ideally. Okay, but now that we have the argument, and let's say you're going to spend three minutes on the argument, what part of this explanation is going to contain the most amount of framing, if that's even grammatically correct? The impact of the argument. Okay, what do you mean by the impact? What do you do in the impact part of the argument? Like explaining why the argument matters and what it means. Okay, I'm not sure I would agree with that. I'd actually think that most of the framing is going to happen in your illustrations, in your examples. Okay? That's where you tell people the stories of how these things work, and that's where you set up, we can even call them if you want, archetypes of how people should think about what's happening in this motion, okay? And I'm going to give you a very, very simple example. So there's a bunch of motions about poor people, right, of the economically deprived, and one of those types of motions is universal income. Do you guys know what that is? Right, so it's an idea that the government should give you money just because you're alive, right? They should give you enough money to survive without asking any questions. And the way I believe this debate is won or lost in 90% of the cases, or maybe even more, is on the description of who are the poor people and what are the poor people like. Right? Because one side, the side that's arguing for universal income, is going to give us a description, hopefully, it's going to give us a description of poor people who aren't poor because of their own fault, who have a bunch of problems, who are constantly trying to get out of poverty but they cannot, who are being abused by their employers, who are often coming from neighborhoods and places where there isn't even enough infrastructure for them to prosper, etc., etc. Whereas on the other hand, what the opposition is going to be saying is that anyone can get a job as long as they, don't, as long as they try hard enough, right? That poor people are of their own fault, the fact that they're poor and that they should just get a job and that they're lazy and that they're going to spend the money on drugs and so on and so forth, right? And at the end of the day, 
this is going to be the crux of the debate. And all of the other arguments, either prop or op, or most of the other arguments that either government or opposition are going to be making, are going to be coming out of this description that they made about what poor people look like. Right? And I would argue that the team that's going to win this debate is going to be the team with the most persuasive description of poor people. Right? And here's the kicker, right? This description doesn't only happen once, right? It isn't that you get your first speech where you go and make an argument and you make this argument about poor people for the first time and then you explain them, uh, describe them, sorry. But this, types of, this description is constantly happening throughout your case. Every single time you talk about poor people, every single time you're going to respond to the opposition's arguments and you're going to decide to disprove the logic but not the framing or the description of poor people, right? You are going to be furthering this idea that poor people are lazy if you're the government right now, okay? So it's important for you to, in these cases, realize what the important descriptions are and fight for those descriptions in Sorry, I don't know what's happening. And fight for those descriptions in your debate, okay? Now, what's important here also is that a lot of these descriptions, and this is just the nature of debating, are going to evolve as the debate progresses, right? So in the beginning, we're going to get a very simplistic description of what, what happens, and then slowly as the arguments build up, we're going to come into more and more complex and specific cases as to what's going to be happening, right? Now, there is one thing that's very important here. It is that teams often have a tendency to deny each and every single thing the other side says. Right? So you're trying, to be, you're trying to disagree with every single thing that comes out of the opposition if you're government or that comes out of government if you're opposition. I would say that that is a bad idea. Okay? Because oftentimes people are going to simply <coughs> give true descriptions. Some poor people are going to use their money on drugs. Right? Some homeless people do spend most of the money that they get on alcohol, right? But that doesn't yet mean that the whole description of the whole group is like that. Now the problem here is the following. Imagine the situation where you come out and start talking about poor people of Let's, let's use a universal income debate, right? So you start talking about poor people, and you say, oh, these are people who are poor, but it's not their fault. They're trying every day to get a job. They're, they're being abused by their employers for minimum wage, right? They have to even work only for tips because they don't, their, pay, their paycheck doesn't even cover whatever, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you give the description, and then you make this argument. And then the other side comes up, right? And they go and say, no, 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 no. The picture that the government is painting is completely wrong here. Right? Poor people have decided on their own whether or not they want to be poor. They could easily get a different job. They could easily try something harder. They could get two jobs. Right? And then they're going to pull out an example of a poor person who made it in life and say, look at this guy. Right? He was poor when he was young. Now he's the richest guy on the planet. Obviously, poor people, it's their own fault for being poor. Right? Now, you have two options in which you're going to respond or in which you're going to try to win this framing fight. One is for you to come back and say, no, 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 all of those descriptions are wrong. Poor people are actually poor because of societal impacts and we should still help them. At which point, I would argue, you're losing. And you're losing because you're trying to stick with your universal description, whereas it is going to be obvious to every judge that at least in some cases, the opposition is more right than you are, right? Because some poor people do manage to get themselves out of poverty, right? And in some cases, yes, it is people's own fault to be, uh, for them to be poor. However, I think what a much, much better way of dealing with this would be is to admit the complexity of the world and come out and fight for the framing on all of the other subgroups of the poor people, right? To come out and say, yes, there are some people who are going to spend every single cent they have on alcohol and drugs. But we say, these people don't matter, these people are in a minority, even if these people use this money on drugs and alcohol, we think we should give it to them. But most people who are poor are going to appreciate this universal income, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. Do you understand what I'm getting at, right? So framing, or the fight on framing, is not a zero-sum game, okay? 
it isn't about you winning everything, it's about you winning enough so that you can win this debate. Right? I think in world schools, this goes even a bit further, especially because there is something that's very interesting. And I think it only exists in world schools, and I like it a lot. Um, if you have a motion, and this is a question for you guys, if we have a motion that says, for instance, this house would never negotiate with terrorists, what does the opposition have to do to win this debate? It has to prove one case in which it's a good idea to talk to terrorists. Ha! It was a trap! No! Yes? Well, the proposition has to prove that it's the majority, and the opposition has to prove that the majority isn't, is flawed, that it's not necessarily the majority, but it's not enough to just disprove one case, because never doesn't mean actually never, but not in the majority. Okay, yes, almost, but there's a much simpler way of putting that. Cast a reasonable doubt over what the proposition is. All right. I think reasonable doubt is something that only exists in courts, not in debate. Uh, you never hear judges deciding on reasonable doubt. There's a, it's written in the rules. It's written in the rules. Yeah? Never, never means never? No. Yeah, never, never means never, of course, but what does it mean? In the back first, and then back here. So, does it do more harm than good if they do that? No, so the motion is never negotiate with terrorists. How do you win an opposition is the question. Like, as an opposition, you would win that by saying in the majority of cases it's not good. No, 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 that's the proposition. In the minority of cases, yeah. That doesn't sound right, does it? No. Okay. Okay, are we out of ideas? You've all come very close. Yeah. Um, don't you just have to prove that like negotiating terrorists like, with terrorists is an important tactic that you can't take off the table? I think that's a concrete strategy, right, that you can use. But there's something else that I wanted to point you guys to. It is a term called significant minority, right? So if the motion is this house would never negotiate with terrorists. The, the way opposition wins is if they manage to show us a significant minority of cases where negotiating with terrorists is okay. Right? Now, this idea of a significant minority at the same time is very fluid. It, it's not written anywhere how we count that. So it's going to be the judge's own decisions, right? But the thing that I'm trying to get to is that if you're on an opposition on a motion like this house would never negotiate with terrorists, the mm, significant minority part of the debate is going to be decided by your framing. Okay? The only thing that's going to decide whether or not the cases that you've outlined on the opposition fall under this umbrella of a significant minority is going to be the way you're going to be describing them. Right? And the way you're going to be arguing for them. Right? So, at the same time, this is what you have to do, but on the other hand, the thing that we were talking before, to never take your framing as an absolute, to be willing to give concessions, you can also keep that in mind, because even on the government, it is okay for you to concede an example or two, or a minority of two, as long as this number isn't significant enough, or as long as you believe that you can argue away from this point of this being a significant minority of cases, but this simply being an insignificant minority of cases. Okay? Does this make sense? Yeah? Do you? Yeah? Um, I'm a little confused about what significant minority means, especially since like, if you're the proposition team, are you saying that you have to raise significant minority or the other side? Does? No, no, the opposition has to. But isn't that helping them since they only have to provide a minority of cases? Yes, but that's also, so of course it's helping the opposition, right? But I think the way this rule was written is with considerations to motion that say never, right? Without this little piece of rule, it would be enough for the opposition to only give you one case uh, where negotiating with terrorists is okay. Right? When we say significant minority, they have to show, yes, there's a minority, but this minority matters, right? And this part of whether or not it matters is the framing fight that you have to win in this debate, right? Okay. Any other questions? No? Cool. Moving on. Number four on how we deal with framing during prep time. Right? After you've already assigned emotional value to your arguments, and after you've already decided what the emotional value of your case is going to be, right? after you have this mapped out, 
it now comes, it now becomes the time to start pimping up your arguments so that they fit with the emotional value that you want them to express. Okay? Now this again is going to come simpler for some and it's going to become harder for, it's going to come as harder for others, but there's a couple of little things that you can do that make, I think, make this job a whole lot easier, right? The first one is remembering what we've already said. Where does most of the framing happen? Exactly, in your illustrations and in your examples, which means that if you want to set the emotional tone for your argument, the thing that you should be pimping out are probably your examples, okay? So if you think that your argument is still missing this little thing that would make it pop or that would make it the frame that you want to put around the argument, that frame is probably going to come from your illustration or going to come from your example, okay? Another piece of advice insofar as examples and illustrations are concerned, if you have to make a switch from one emotional state to a different one, and that change is a rather large one, right? what could be helpful is you running your illustration before the argument. Okay? Most of the time, the way we would make the arguments would be, oh, I'm going to prove this and this and this to you, and this is the statement, and then you explain the logic of the argument, and then in the end you come into some example that you're going to give to us. Right? The problem or the issue with this approach sometimes is the fact that when you're going to say what you're going to prove, Right? You don't yet get to control the emotional state of your listeners to the extent that you want to uh, until you come to the point of presenting the examples. Right? So in this case, it might make sense for you to tell us a short story of an example before you say what you're going to prove to us to prep your audience for that emotional state. Right? At the same time, I would encourage you to write down your introductions and conclusions. Okay? I think this can fall under number five, right? which is the way you handle your intros and conclusions. Now, I think it's very important, at least from the little story I told you about my failure in debating, um, that you make sure your introduction is actually going to help people understand what you're about to say in your arguments. If that doesn't happen, then you've had a bad introduction. Right? At the same time, I believe your conclusion should also serve a specific purpose. But before we can analyze those, we have to take a moment and go in a bit, in a slightly different direction. Which is, consider how speeches happen in the debate and how they're actually structured. So you're going to get the first speaker who's going to come out and say, oh, this is the motion, this is my introduction, definitions, model, argument, argument, okay, thanks, bye, right? Now, the way we usually view speeches, or the way we would like to think about them, is that number one, they begin when the person starts speaking, and number two, they end when the person stops speaking. Which I would argue, neither of these two things are true. Right? And the most, I don't know, extreme example, or the simplest example that I can give you guys, is consider this lecture right here. Right? I was five minutes late. Okay? Even though I didn't yet show up, and I didn't say anything, I was already influencing the way you people were thinking about whatever is going to happen next, okay? If I was half an hour late, you guys would have a completely different approach as to what's going to happen here in this lecture and to what I'm about to say and so on and so forth, even though technically I didn't even yet start my speech, right? So it is slightly faulty to believe that your speech is going to begin at the moment you start speaking, okay? Secondly, your speech also shouldn't end as soon as you stop speaking, right? Consider the example of me wanting a lollipop, right? And I convince you guys to go get me a lollipop in the store. Whereas halfway to the store, you forget what I asked you to do, and you never come back with a lollipop, right? So even though in debate land, we might say immediately after my lollipop speech that I get 82 points for a brilliant lollipop speech, but at the end of the day, I didn't persuade you people into anything if I didn't get my lollipop, right? So at the same time, thinking about the end of your speech as being the point where you stop speaking, I think is also very, very wrong. And I think that the way we consider the beginnings and the ends should always be tailored to the context that we're in. So in this case, you guys are part of a debate, okay? There's a bunch of things happening. When you stop speaking, the judge is still going to be writing things down. They are going to be rushing to write things down because they don't want to keep the debate waiting. They don't want to keep the other judges waiting. Okay? And they're going to be preparing their notes 
for their second speech. So what I would say is if you want to plan your conclusion properly, what you want to consider is what the next speech is going to be about and make a conclusion that is emotionally as destructive as possible to that speech. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So what I did to myself in that example that we talked about before in the abortion debate is what I think you should be doing to, a, to the other team. Right? If you can reasonably predict that the framing of their argument is going to be angry because of the motion and because you know pretty much how the other side is going to debate, then I guess you want to have the saddest conclusion possible right? to force the judge to take on a particular view of what's going to happen then, which is going to make them understand less or even engage with the material that's coming from the opposition in a much, much worse way. Does this make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, what do you put in your introductions and in your conclusions, right? Because I don't think this idea of me telling you that they should be emotionally consistent with the other things that you have to say is particularly helpful. So, one of the ways you can always do your introductions is by choosing a very powerful illustration or an example uh, from the array of examples that you have in your speeches. A second very interesting way of doing introductions and conclusions would be by coming up with a fake story about a very important stakeholder in that debate, so a group of people who care a lot about what's going to happen in that debate, and giving that one person a name, and then telling me stuff about them. And you begin your speech with describing, if you're on the government side for instance, you begin your speech with describing this little boy named Dianes who now has this type of a life and then after your speech is over you finish off by saying if you were to support the government motion the way Yanis would live his life would be blah 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 and you give a completely different picture of his life which is now suddenly much more powerful much more interesting he's a much happier person so on and so forth right so this is another way in which you can do your uh, introductions and in which you can do your conclusions and lastly, number three, this is going to be a negative piece of advice, is please, please, please do not conclude with a recap of what you just said in debating, uh, because, at least from my experience, and from me talking and judging with a variety of different judges, this is one of our favorite moments in debating, when it's 30 seconds till the end of the speech, and somebody goes, so, Mr. Speaker, what I've told you in this speech, and I, I, I've put my pen down, I'm not paying attention anymore, I don't care. Right? Because you've just told me that you're going to say the same things to me that you've already said. And there's a couple of things that can happen in there for me as a judge. One, you're going to repeat yourself, which, there's no point in me writing that down. B, you're not going to repeat yourself, which is going to make you inconsistent and which is going to effectively make you lie about what you did in your speech, which is also not going to be very useful for you. Right? So in terms of you wanting to be successful and impactful in your conclusions, I would advise steer away from this idea of recapping all of the arguments that you made. Okay, we should now be at point number six, or number five, depending on how you were counting them, as far as framing is concerned. And the question now becomes, what do we do with rebuttal and framing? Okay? Because this presents itself as a particular problem, because if we agree that we have two teams in the debate, and both of them are good at framing the debate in the way that they want, you're going to be forced to engage with the arguments by the other side that are going to be described in words that are harming your case simply by you saying them. Okay? Now, there's a couple of things that you have to do here. Number one, I think there's a legitimate, I don't want to call it rebuttal strategy, right? But I think it is a legitimate way of tackling these ideas by directly negating the way these arguments are framed, right? By destroying the explanations and the pictures that the other side has painted and painting us a new picture that subsequently destroys the argument, right? So for instance, the very simple example that we have of universal income. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Super fun. I have your motion. Okay, so um, back to the four people in universal income example, right? So you've got the opposition who has now come back saying poor people are lazy, oh, they spend all their money on drugs, yada, 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 yada. If we give them this money, this is only going to cause more violence uh, on the streets because people are going to get shit-faced on coke and then do horrible things to each other, right? And we don't want a society where we give money to people even though we know they're just going to get high on coke and break cars and bones and people and so on and so forth. Right? And this is the argument that you get. Now, the way you're going to successfully refute this argument, if ever, right, is going to be by providing a completely different narrative and a completely different description of how things are going to happen for those poor people. Right? However, <coughs> there are still two ways in which you can do this. The first one is, you come out and say, no, 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 no. The description that we got from the opposition about poor people only using, only spending this money on coke and then going out and breaking things is completely wrong because poor people want to use this money to better their own lives. Okay? Now I think we can all pretty much agree that this is going to be a fairly losing strategy in this debate, right? Because you're not going to be able to convince the judge that each and every poor person is going to spend this money in a good way. There's obviously going to be some people who are going to go on a coke binge and then break the stuff. Okay? So that's number one. The way you do, however, interpret it, right, or solve this, you take it realistically and you say, yes, some people are going to be spending their money on drugs, right? They are going to be going on coke binges and they are going to be doing some horrible things. But, but, because we also have rich people who go on coke binges and break things, right? We don't think this is necessarily connected to those people being poor. So insofar as we're trying to solve the problem of those people being poor, we think that problem still solved. But if we want to solve the problem of people going on coke binges, breaking things, and so on and so forth, right, we should tackle this in a different way, probably with a more sensible drug policy. Right? But at the end of the day, you don't get to say that people who are poor don't get to abuse drugs just because they don't have money while you're perfectly fine for rich people to go on coke binges and break things because somehow it's okay because they're spending their own hard-earned or hard-inherited money uh, when they go up about and do this, right? So do you understand the difference that we're using here, right? That, that we're pointing out here. In one case, you're trying to attack directly the framing that you're most probably going to lose, right? In the other case, you accept that as a minor situation and then provide a much better narrative as to what's going to happen. Now, any questions on this? No, okay. Next point, which is probably going to explain a bit what we talked about right now, number seven, is the way you should engage in framing. So until now, we've only been saying that framing is mostly going to come out of descriptions that you're going to be using and that you're going to be explaining to people, and that's basically it. The question then becomes, how do these descriptions function? How do you structure them? How do you make them the most effective possible? Okay? <coughs> In every single debate that you're going to have, every single debate that you're going to have, you're effectively going to be doing two things. And I don't think there's much more to debating. Obviously, I'm slightly simplifying. But number one, you're going to identify, we can say three things, comes out better. You're going to identify groups of people who care about this motion. You're going to call them stakeholders in some cases. But at the end of the day, because you're upper middle class and you don't care about anything, you have to think about people who do care about the motions that you're debating. Okay? Secondly, you're going to describe these people. In every single debate, you're going to engage in these descriptions. The problem, I would argue, is that most of the time you're going to engage in these descriptions unconsciously or subconsciously, so to speak, right? You're not going to actively try and decide how should we describe these poor people now, right? But you're going to bring in your own assumptions as to what's happening in this debate, and this is going to be tremendously harmful. It's going to be harmful because those descriptions are going to be broken. Why? because you will be spending an hour only thinking about one side of the motion. A couple of things are going to happen. 
One, you are not going to come up with potential different views of these groups of people. Number two, you are going to start taking things that are not obvious as obvious because you've been spending an hour thinking hard about this one little thing. Then when it comes to debating, you are going to leave out these non-obvious things that seem obvious to you and you're going to effectively lose the framing fight that has happened in the debate. Okay? So, you do first uh, identify the groups of people you're going to be debating about, then you describe them, and then lastly, this is the third step, or if you want to include the first two in one, then it's the second one, is you have now designed a system and you have explained what the rules of, those, of that system are. What you want to do now is you want to apply those rules to a specific situation in real life and tell us what will happen. Okay? A very simple example, again going back to the universal income point, right? First we say, okay, this is stakeholder group number one, poor people. Description of stakeholder group number one, people are poor because of a variety of different things that happen to them in their lives. Mostly it's not their fault, they want to do everything they can to get out of poverty because poverty sucks, right? Number three, now that we have the group and the description, we can make reasonable predictions as to what's going to happen when you give 500 bucks a month to each and every one of them, to each and every member of that one group, right? So you're going to say, because these people are poor and they haven't been poor because of their own fault, and because they want to do everything they can to live themselves out of poverty, every single month when they're going to get 500 bucks, they're going to use this money in this, 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 and this way, and they're going to achieve this, 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 and this result, and at the end of the day, we get a better world, which is why we win. Does this make sense? Right? I would say that most, let's call them policy debates, all of the arguments in them are going to take the same form, right? Whether or not you're explicitly and consciously going to engage in this type of argumentation is a completely different question, right? But at the end of the day, there's going to be these three things that judges are going to consider. Who are the people? What are those people? How do they react? How do they function, right? What are the rules of these people functioning? And then lastly, what happens when we apply these rules in a new context, which is now in this particular case, everyone gets 500 bucks a month, right? Now, the way you want to engage with this is firstly, I think you want to take this process consciously and you want to engage in it every single time that you're going to be debating, right? So I want you to seriously consider when you make arguments, check whether or not you have identified clearly a stakeholder group. Secondly, whether you're satisfied with the description of how these people and institutions and whatever act, uh, react and enact things, right? And then lastly, that you have an explanation as to how this is going to happen in real life in a very specific situation. Now, <clears throat> this however, I think presents a very interesting and very subtle problem which is that most of the time, the way debaters are going to engage in these descriptions, they are going to make, and I'm sorry, and please keep on asking questions if I'm going to be unclear because I have trouble explaining this even to myself uh, with different words. I think debaters mostly make static descriptions and static arguments, okay? So this is the way things are. This is, so when most people are going to be making arguments, these arguments are going, can all be prefaced with half of the sentence saying, this is the way things are. The way things are is blah, 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 here comes the argument, right? Whereas what I think you should be doing is engaging in a way that says, the way things work or the way things will be is this, 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 and this, right? <coughs> so also when it comes down to the descriptions of different stakeholders, I don't think so while I do think it's effective, I don't think it's as effective as it can be for you to go and start describing homeless people in a static way, right? So you say, oh, homeless people are poor, they uh, have no home, they sleep on the sidewalk, they are stinky, they have bad clothes, right? Even though that description in the long run will be helpful to you, 
The reason it's not is that at the point where you come to the argument that you're trying to make about homeless people, you have to turn this static description into an active one, right? Where you have to change the point where you go say, where you say, uh, homeless people stink and have bad clothes into because they don't have money, they are unable to buy good clothes and therefore they are ostracized in the society, right? So at the end of the day, you're doing the same legwork twice, right? And it can become confusing because the first explanation or the first description is going to be much more explicit and people are going to remember it much more fondly, right? Which is going to render your argument slightly less powerful. So what I would suggest to you guys is that whenever you're trying to make a description, is you, tr you should try to tell me a story. I don't think anything else matters, right? Nobody cares at the end of the day about how these people look like, what they are. What we do care about is what they do and how they are going to react in certain specific situations. Okay? <clears throat> so I think that if you want to achieve a good framing of your debate, it isn't going to be enough for you to identify those groups of people and give us a static explanation of what they do. But instead, I want to invite you to tell us a bunch of stories about these people. Okay? Does this make sense? Are there any questions? No. Okay. Now. Moving on, we still got 20 minutes about this uh, to take care of these things. So, the next thing that comes into play is this idea that we just spoke about, right? So, insofar as we realize that you shouldn't be making static descriptions, but you should be making active ones, that you should be telling stories, the question then becomes, how far do you go with these stories, or what do you exactly do, right? Does that mean that all of your debating speeches should just be one big giant narrative? Probably not, right? You're still going to have to have arguments. However, I believe that there's a couple of rules that you can all follow to make your descriptions much more successful and much more impactful. Okay? Before we go into that, however, a bit of, let's call it theory. So, your brain, and we know this fairly well, um, has developed through years and years and years of evolution or intelligent design, whichever way you want to look at it, right? But I think we'll all agree that your brain has changed in the past, and it's constantly changing. However, there is one thing that is very specific to the human brain, right? And there's a lot of different variations when we try to explain why human beings are so special and different from animals, but there's one thing that we have that most animals don't have, which is a giant frontal lobe, this front part of the brain, which is huge, Relative, uh, relative to other, um, to other species. Now, what this part of the brain does mostly is it simulates realities, right? It simulates different scenarios, and this is happening constantly. There's even research that shows that we're constantly living about a second and a half to two seconds in the future. So what you're seeing isn't what's actually happening. It's a two-second prediction in the future that your brain is trying to constantly make, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is that I think you'll all agree when you found yourself walking down the street imagining an impossible situation of like a person jumping out of the car with two katanas and how you're going to escape that person were that to happen, right? This is something that your brain is constantly engaged in and this is something that the judges are constantly going to be engaging in as well. And I think it's only fair to expect the judges that are going to be listening to you are going to be simulating different ways of the argument that you people are having of playing out, right? I don't think anyone can fight this, and especially not when we spent years and years debating and training our brains to come up with different scenarios of how to respond to things as quickly as possible. Now, the way this works however, this simulation, is that it always takes, form, takes the form of a story. Now, what's even more interesting is that if you look at different cultures throughout the ages, and even today, right, and you look at cultures who have writing, who don't have writing, you look at cultures who have produced, cultures who have produced great technological advantage, uh, advances and to cultures that some people would still argue live in the Stone Age, whatever that means, uh, all of them tell stories and what's even more amazing is that all of these stories have the same structure, right? It seems as if the whole world is constantly repeating one single story. And if that is true, and insofar as we've seen that the greatest works of art are the ones that have captivated people's attention to the highest extent, I think there's a lesson to be learned for debating from there, right? And what I'd argue is that you want to tell the same story as 
all of the big writers and poets and everyone else has been saying, has been telling us in the past. Now, <clears throat> how is that story structured? It's very simple, right? Number one, the story has a hero, okay? It has a main character, it has someone we are going to personify with. It is the person who things are happening to, okay? Now, in your case, when you're going to be debating, or when you're going to try to frame your debate in the best way possible, right? There's a couple of different things that you can do, and there's a couple of different ways you can identify your hero. It can be a made-up person, like we talked before when we were talking about introduction and conclusion. It can also be an institution, right? Your hero can also be a country, right? A group of people living together in a bad way or in a good way, right? A hero can also be, I don't know, a bad person that you're going to rehabilitate. So it depends on the motion uh, of how exactly you're going to structure your hero, but the point that I'm trying to make here is it doesn't matter who the hero is. And I don't think it takes much effort for you to realize that if you just turn on Cartoon Network and see the weird shit that ha that's happening there, right? And the amount of variety we have in heroes, and some of them make sense, a lot of them don't make sense anymore, right? But at the end of the day, you just need something that you're going to attach your story to. Now, in your debate, I believe that something, right, your hero should be the stakeholder that you think is going to be the most important one in the debate, okay? You have to make a bet, you're going to have to make a call in this instance. Then once you have that stakeholder, there's a couple of things you have to do in order for this to be an effective story. Number two, so if number one is the stakeholder or the hero, number two is the enemy, the arch enemy, right? Which technically speaking, needs to be so big that it's almost impossible for us to believe that the hero can actually beat that enemy. Okay? So, again, in a debate, this could be absolutely anything. And I think it's best we choose, we start talking about emotion here so that you guys can better, info, can better visualize this. So let's use, let's use an extreme motion and say, this house would legalize all drugs. Okay? You are the government, you want to legalize all drugs. Who is the hero? The drugs. How does that work exactly? I don't think that would work. <laughs> Who could be your hero? Drug users. One at a time. Yeah. Freedom. How can freedom be the hero? Okay, you're gonna have to have a why with every suggestion you give. Yeah. Budget. The budget? Okay, but is then the budget the hero? Sorry? Is, is it the budget that you want to talk about? Sorry? Okay, maybe, possibly, yeah. Wouldn't the government be the hero? Because they're giving people personal freedoms? Okay. Or uh, the people in poor communities who were once going to jail on drug sentencing, but now they're free and the communities are stuck in poverty. Okay. Not even necessarily poor people, but um, you could, you, know, you could have a bit of society and the drug users are there because they have they face this war on drugs and then they receive money in taxes. So if you're going to make this policy debate. And also the drug users, because, um, and not just the poor ones, but rich ones as well, because they have gained that extra thing. Cool. Anything else? Who else can be the hero? Let's <coughs> hope this works. Genius. Okay. So, what was the list? Number one? Heroes. Go, oh, once again. Come on, don't tell me you forgot. The government. The people in poor communities who aren't going to be able to help. Let's specify that. Drug users in poor communities. Drug users. Poor drug users. Well, they were the drug sellers. Poor drug dealers. 
Can a rich drug dealer be a hero in this debate? Yes. How? Sorry, you're going to have to be louder. But they can do that today if they want to, right? The point of the argument is that the government then forces them to start providing safe drugs. So I don't think a rich drug dealer can actually be a successful hero under this motion. Okay, any other heroes? Society that benefits from like, increasing safety. Okay, as a sociologist, I am giving you this as truth written in the universe. There is no such thing as society. Right? It doesn't exist. You cannot make a concise argument about something that happens with the society, okay? And we can have a very long discussion about this, and I'd love to have it with you guys. But, as a rule of thumb, whenever you want to make an argument that contains the word society, you're doing it wrong. Scratch it and try to do it again with a more specific group of people in mind. It's going to become a much stronger argument. Are victims of drug violence? Cool. Who else? Taxpayers. Or, ta or people who benefit from taxes. Okay, be specific. Um, You're going to have to tell a story. Which tax benefiter is the best one in this case? Anyone receiving benefits, for example? Okay. So, can we call them unemployed? Politicians. Yeah? Politicians? As heroes? How? Okay, I think we have enough. Obviously, we could go with more. Okay. Um, cool. So these are our heroes. Now, I want us to go through, and we're going to find an arch enemy for each and every one of those heroes. Okay? So number one, the government. The motion is still legalized. All drugs. Okay. Who's the arch enemy of the government? Drug cartels. Drug cartels. Anyone disagree? Okay. Poor drug users. Police. Arch enemy. Rich drug police. Police slash rich drug dealers. <laughs> okay, I'm going to argue that this is o that only the police comes here and that rich drug dealers are the arch enemies of the poor drug dealers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Victims of drug violence. Arch enemy? <laughs> ah, let's think about that. Are we really sure that the perpetrators of drug violence are the best bet here? Right? Because people who, who commit drug violence are high on coke. Does that sound like a reasonable arch enemy? No, yes. drug dealers. Drug dealers? Yes. Yeah, you got. Yeah, uh, drug cartels. Cool. Drug dealers? I think this is epic. Drug cartels and governments. Okay, unemployed. The government is the arch enemy? Okay. So what I'm going to suggest here is that maybe this isn't, isn't even a good option for us to try to construct a story. Right? At this point. I'm going to, to speed things up, we're going to drop this one off. Because I think it's going to be much, much harder to achieve the effect that I want to show you guys, okay? Cool. So we're dropping the unemployed. Okay, now, in every story, once we have uh, the hero and the arch enemy, there's a couple of things that need to happen, right? Usually, the story is going to start off by the hero accepting a mission, going on a mission, and failing, right? Because it is too big for them to handle. Then they're going to get a piece of advice or magical power or some help from some other big power, whatever, which is then going to enable them to beat the arch enemy and change the face of the earth forever. Right? Now, we have the hero, we have the arch enemy. The first failing fight, what is this? 
in a debate, right? If we say that in every story we have to have a fight where the hero fails, which part of your debate is this? If we're the government on legalize all drugs, yes? The war on drugs? Exactly, right? The current context, okay? So when you start off your speech and when you try to explain why we're debating this, this is effectively the first... So, a movie, a movie that all of you have seen, a movie... Have, have all of you seen Iron Man 3? Yeah. Yes. No? Okay. Have all of you seen... Okay, enough of you have seen it. I actually think that has that movie has a very very nice story arc, right? So uh, in Iron Man three, at one point, they the the bad guys destroy Tony Stark's home and all the suits and everything, and then he's dragged on to a completely different part uh, of the states, where he then slowly rebuilds his suit and comes back and kicks ass, and that's it, right? But the point is that without us seeing the scene where his home is destroyed and everything else, we wouldn't have had the chance to follow him or his journey of repairing the suit and fixing his own soul and getting rid of the alcoholism or whatever, right? Uh, wouldn't have been able to happen, right? And in your speeches, in the debate, it is extremely important for you to give us a reason as to why we are debating this, and this is the introductory story, which is the first failed fight of the hero. Okay, what is the magical power or the piece of wisdom in a debate? Emotion. Sorry? Emotion. The motion, yes. That is what we're trying to change, okay? And then lastly, the big fight is going to be your arguments, right? So when you think about it this way, at least this has helped me, right? You have the two heroes, so we have the government and the drug cartels. Who's willing to tell us the story number one? in 30 seconds. No one. All right, so I'll give you the first story, and then we're going to go through all of these stories so that we can construct them, right? So, way back when drugs were still, drugs were still illegal, the governments were fighting drug cartels but constantly losing. There were people dying all over the globe. There were families who have lost their sons, daughters, and it was all, all terribly tragic. Then one day, the team government showed up and said, we would like to legalize all drugs. And we would like to legalize all drugs because that would then diminish the amount of violence that we would have in our society because no one would have to protect their drugs with guns because there wouldn't be police or army that would show up knocking on those drug dealers' doors to take their drugs away. And in a world where we have legalized drugs, the governments have successfully beat drug cartels and drug cartels are completely gone. Right? So this is a very simple way of telling that story. Right? Now I want you guys to try to give me number two, three, and then three variations of four. Who wants to give it a go? Come on, it's not that hard. It really isn't. Yeah? Alright, so... When there were poor drug users and the police, it's that the hero and the enemy that's up there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, hero so and enemy. And police. Okay. So, there were poor drug users who had often been tricked into becoming addicted to drugs or in a bad spot, addicted to drugs, and continued to use that as part of their lifestyle, but were frequently caught by the police because there were drug laws in place that said it was illegal, and the police would arrest them, throw them in jail, making it hard for them to keep a job, driving them further into poverty, and making their life miserable. But then someone proposed that you would erase this problem by making drugs legal, and once you legalize drugs, these poor drug users who are in a bad place could now get help instead of being persecuted by the police. Okay. Uh, cool. Anyone like to add anything to it? Uh, the only thing I would change was the ending where you go, they could get help from could get help too, they now will get help or do get help, and then what are all the nice things that happen. Okay, number three, poor drug dealers versus rich drug dealers. Yep. There was people, there was some guys who were trying to make money, who were trying to get themselves an education, and they couldn't make money in a normal way to even have enough their families to support them. So they started selling selling drugs for small sales to try and earn some money, and they kept getting um, and had to be chased out by the big drug dealers who had lots of drugs and lots of hitmen for 
impact them. And then you don't okay, I'm going to stop you now. Do you feel how your story is becoming absurd? Yes. Okay, this is because it is untrue, right? And I, and I think this is a very, very good mechanism to check your own arguments, right? So what is the actual relationship between poor drug dealers and rich drug dealers? The rich drug dealers aren't trying to chase the poor drug dealers out, but... No, 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 no. Yeah, what? they use the poor drug dealers and make them do the dangerous stuff while they stay safe. Yes, okay. Now, give me the story again with the way things actually work. Well, the poor guy wants to reach the money and lose, but finds his dealer and asks him to set him up with a job, starts to live, starts to live drugs, gets put to the bed, gets trapped No, 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 you're missing the crucial piece of information. Right? So the poor drug dealer comes to the rich drug dealer and says, I want a job, I need to feed my family, I have to do something, right? The rich drug dealer goes, ooh, brilliant idea, right? And gives this guy a bag of coke and sets him on the most dangerous corner in downtown LA, right? It, two days pass, the poor drug dealer is dealing drugs, the police show up, pick him up, throw him into prison, right? So the motive of why the rich drug dealer decides to do something bad to the poor drug dealer is very, very important here, right? Because that's the logic that you're going to be applying when you're going to be proposing a solution. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's try again. Um, poor drug dealer, poor guy goes up to feed his family, goes up to the richest current drug dealer, asks him to sell some stuff for them, goes and um, got a gift with some late coke or something, whatever. He goes off and goes down to the dodgiest area of town, gets there, he's trying to reach some money, trying to sell it, and then um, the police come and arrest him, and not arrest him, he contacts the British drug dealer, and he gets his trouble and can't make any arrest him as well. And now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Um, and then the government legalizes drugs and he can have a job properly and sell drugs legally and he can feed his family and he can get himself an education and all that's happy ever after. Okay, this now in the end was very bad because you were rushing and didn't really care. But, um, do you understand what's happening here? Right? Do you see how you can use this in your debates? The thing that I find fascinating about this is the fact that these are not arguments, but they are incredibly persuasive. Right? Even though we're not making, our, we're just telling stories here, it seems as if we're winning the case for our own side. Right? And I think even choosing this type of a method in your prep time, if you want to find a way to frame this, just list different heroes, find their arch enemies, and then write the stories or say the, tell us the stories that uh, grow between them. Now, just the last one, quickly, right? So we have number four, where we say victims of drug violence, and we have three different arch enemies here. And I think that's a very interesting uh, example, especially because of that, right? Because it opens up three different areas of argumentation for you, right? So all of these three legitimate arch enemies offer you a legitimate way of arguing why drugs should be legal, right? But you say, there's a bunch of victims of drug violence Right now, because drug dealers shoot them because they don't have money, or there's collateral damage where there's drug wars on the street, etc., etc., if you legalize drugs, this goes away, right? Secondly, drug cartels are trying to take away land so they can grow coke in Mexico, and they are shooting down militias that are only trying to protect their own homes, and they are attacking honest American soldiers fighting a non-war on Mexican soil, so on and so forth, right? So you get a different type of argument and a different type of story here. And then the third type of story, right, which is victims of drug violence versus the government, right, where you again talk about how the government is going to handle this. Now, we have run out of time. Are there any questions? No. Was this help? Yes. In what, which part can actually argumentation come in? Can you separate the story at some point? Built in so, and then say it's going to happen like this and this and this. I think this is great for introductions. Um, but to be honest, to give you the, 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 the most correct answer I know, you know how we say that each and every speech needs to have an introduction, a core, or whatever, and a conclusion? Yeah? Well, I think these are all lies. In the sense that if you've ever read a good book, or if you've ever written, or if you've ever heard a good speech, for you as a member of the audience, or for you as a reader of that book, you had zero chance 
of figuring out which was the introduction, what was the core, and what was the conclusion. So I would argue that in a good speech, you don't know where the introduction starts and when it ends, or where the argument starts or where it doesn't end. Right? And this is why I say these are all lies, but these are necessary lies in order to help you organize your own thoughts. Right? So whenever you're going to be thinking about these things, I would suggest don't try to look for an effect on how this is going to show up in my speech. Right? So don't try to ask the question, what words do I say to make an argument or to make a story or to make a conclusion or to make an introduction. Right? Instead, use this as a way to organize your own speech, which then hopefully is going to flow as easily as possible. I know this is, this is a non-answer really, but hope it helps a bit. Anything else? No. Was this helpful? What was the most useless thing you heard in this hour and a half? Okay. Your debate starts at 5.30. I'm going to read out the motion. Um, okay, I'm also going to give you the teams and then I'm going... I don't have any scotch tape, so I'm just going to try and stick this here. So, Canada Red government... Uh, government teams are Canada Red, Germany, India, Slovakia, Utomer, London, Patterson, Varane, Jarvis, Poplar Trees, Slovenia, Team USA Blue and Team USA Red. Anyone who wasn't 